Chapter Fifteen of the Book of Werewolves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martina van Haperen, Amsterdam. The Book of Werewolves by Sabine Baring Gould. Chapter Fifteen. Anomalous Case: The Human Hyena. Ghouls. Story from Fornari. Quotation from Apuleius. Incident mentioned by Marcassus. Cemeteries of Paris violated. Discovery of Violator. Confession of Monsieur Bertrand. It is well known that Oriental romance is full of stories of violators of graves. Eastern superstition attributes to certain individuals a passion for unearthing corpses and mangling them. Of a moonlight night, weird forms are seen stealing among the tombs and burrowing into them with their long nails, desiring to reach the bodies of the dead ere the first streak of dawn compels them to retire. These ghouls, as they are called, are supposed generally to require the flesh of the dead for incantations or magical compositions but very often they are actuated by the sole desire of rending the sleeping corpse and disturbing its repose. There is every probability that these ghouls were no mere creations of the imagination, but were actual resurrectionists. Human fat and the hair of a corpse which has grown in the grave form ingredients in many a necromantic recept, and the witches who compounded these diabolical mixtures would unearth corpses in order to obtain the requisite ingredients. It was the same in the Middle Ages, and to such an extent did the fear of ghouls extend, that it was common in Brittany for churchyards to be provided with lamps, kept burning during the night, that witches might be deterred from venturing under cover of darkness to open the graves. Fornari gives the following story of a ghoul in his History of Sorcerers. In the beginning of the fifteenth century, there lived at Baghdad an aged merchant who had grown wealthy in his business, and who had an only son, to whom he was tenderly attached. He resolved to marry him to the daughter of another merchant, a girl of considerable fortune, but without any personal attractions. Abul Hassan, the merchant's son, on being shown the portrait of the lady, requested his father to delay the marriage till he could reconcile his mind to it. Instead, however, of doing this, he fell in love with another girl, the daughter of a sage, and he gave his father no peace till he consented to the marriage with the object of his affections. The old man stood out as long as he could, but finding that his son was bent on acquiring the hand of the fair Nadilla, and was equally resolute not to accept the rich and ugly lady, he did what most fathers under such circumstances are constrained to do. He acquiesced. The wedding took place with great pomp and ceremony, and a happy honeymoon ensued, which might have been happier but for one little circumstance, which led to very serious consequences. Abul Hassan noticed that his bride quitted the nuptial couch as soon as she thought her husband was asleep, and did not return to it till an hour before dawn. Filled with curiosity, Hassan one night feigned sleep, and saw his wife rise and leave the room as usual. He followed cautiously, and saw her enter a cemetery. By the straggling moonbeams he beheld her go into a tomb. He stepped in after her. The scene within was horrible. A party of ghouls were assembled with the spoils of the graves they had violated, and were feasting on the flesh of the long-buried corpses. His own wife, who, by the way, never touched supper at home, played no inconsiderable part in the hideous banquet. As soon as he could safely escape, Abul Hassan stole back to his bed. He said nothing to his bride till next evening when supper was laid, and she declined to eat. Then he insisted on her partaking, and when she positively refused, he exclaimed wrathfully, Yes, 
you keep your appetite for your feasts with the ghouls nadilla was silent she turned pale and trembled and without a word sought her bed at midnight she rose fell on her husband with her nails and teeth tore his throat and having opened a vein attempted to suck his blood but abu hassan springing to his feet threw her down and with a blow killed her she was buried next day three days after at midnight she reappeared attacked her husband again and again attempted to suck his blood he fled from her and on the morrow opened her tomb burned her to ashes and cast them into the tigris this story connects the ghoul with the vampire as will be seen by a former chapter the werewolf and the vampire are closely related that the ancients held the same belief that the witches violate corpses is evident from the third episode in the golden ass of apuleius i will only quote the words of the crier i pray thee tell me replied i of what kind are the duties attached to this funeral guardianship duties quoth the crier why keep wide awake all night with thine eyes fixed steadily upon the corpse neither winking nor blinking nor looking to the right nor looking to the left either to one side or the other be it even little for the witches infamous wretches that they are can slip out of their skins in an instant and change themselves into the form of any animal they have a mind and then they crawl along so slyly that the eyes of justice nay the eyes of the sun himself are not keen enough to perceive them at all events their wicked devices are infinite in number and variety and whether it be in the shape of a bird or a dog or a mouse or even of a common housefly that they exercise their dire incantations if thou art not vigilant in the extreme they will deceive thee one way or the other and overwhelm thee with sleep nevertheless as regards the reward it will be from four to six aurei nor although tis a perilous service wilt thou receive more nay hold i had almost forgotten to give thee a necessary caution clearly understand that if the corpse be not restored to the relatives entire the deficient pieces of flesh torn off by the teeth of the witches must be replaced from the face of the sleepy guardian here we have the rending of corpses connected with change of form marcassus relates that after a long war in syria during the night troops of lamias female evil spirits appeared upon the field of battle unearthing the hastily buried corpses of the soldiers and devouring the flesh of their bones they were pursued and fired upon and some young men succeeded in killing a considerable number but during the day they had all of them the forms of wolves or hyenas that there is a foundation of truth in these horrible stories and that it is quite possible for a human being to be possessed of a depraved appetite for rending corpses is proved by an extraordinary case brought before a court-martial in paris so late as july tenth eighteen forty nine the details are given with fullness in the annal medico psychologique for that month and year they are too revolting for reproduction i will however give an outline of this remarkable case in the autumn of eighteen forty eight several of the cemeteries in the neighbourhood of paris were found to have been entered during the night and the graves to have been rifled the deeds were not those of medical students for the bodies had not been carried off but were found lying about the tombs in fragments it was at first supposed that the perpetration of these outrages must have been a wild beast but footprints in the soft earth left no doubt that it was a man close watch was kept at pere la chaise but after a few corpses had been mangled there the outrages ceased in the winter another cemetery was ravaged 
and it was not till March 1849 that a spring gun which had been set in the cemetery of St. Parnasse went off during the night and warned the guardians of the place that the mysterious visitor had fallen into their trap. They rushed to the spot, only to see a dark figure in a military mantle leap the wall and disappear in the gloom. Marks of blood, however, gave evidence that he had been hit by the gun when it had discharged. At the same time, a fragment of blue cloth torn from the mantle was obtained and afforded a clue towards the identification of the ravisher of the tombs. On the following day, the police went from barrack to barrack, inquiring whether officer or man was suffering from a gunshot wound. By this means, they discovered the person. He was a junior officer in the 1st Infantry Regiment, of the name of Bertrand. He was taken to the hospital to be cured of his wound, and on his recovery he was tried by court-martial. His history was this. He had been educated in the theological cemetery of Langres, till, at the age of twenty, he entered the army. He was a young man of retiring habits, frank and cheerful to his comrades, so as to be greatly beloved by them. Of feminine delicacy and refinement, and subject to fits of depression and melancholy. In February 1847, as he was walking with a friend in the country, he came to a churchyard, the gate of which stood open. The day before, a woman had been buried, but the sexton had not completed filling in the grave, and he had been engaged upon it on the present occasion when a storm of rain had driven him to shelter. Bertrand noticed the spade and pick lying beside the grave, and, to use his own words, A cette vue des idées noires me vint, j'eus comme un violent mal de tête, mon cœur battait avec force, je ne me possédais plus. He managed by some excuse to get rid of his companion, and then, returning to the churchyard, he caught up a spade and began to dig into the grave. Soon I dragged the corpse out of the earth and began to hash it with the spade, without well knowing what I was about. A labourer saw me, and I laid myself flat on the ground till he was out of sight, and then I cast the body back into the grave. I then went away, bathed in cold sweat, to a little grove where I reposed for several hours, notwithstanding the cold rain which fell, in a condition of complete exhaustion. When I rose, my limbs were as if broken, and my head weak. The same prostration and sensation followed each attack. Two days after, I returned to the cemetery, and opened the grave with my hands. My hands bled, but I did not feel the pain. I tore the corpse to shreds, and flung it back into the pit. He had no further attack for four months, till his regiment came to Paris. As he was one day walking in the gloomy, shadowy alleys of Père Lachaise, the same feeling came over him like a flood. In the night he climbed a wall and dug up a little girl of seven years old. He tore her in half. A few days later he opened the grave of a woman who had died in childbirth, and had lain in the grave for thirteen days. On the 16th of November, he dug up an old woman of fifty, and, ripping her to pieces, rolled among the fragments. He did the same to another corpse on the 12th of December. These are only a few of the numerous cases of violation of tombs to which he owned. It was on the night of the 15th of March that the spring gun shot him. Bertrand declared at his trial that whilst he was in the hospital he had not felt any desire to renew his attempts and that he considered himself cured of his horrible propensities, for he had seen men dying in the beds around him, and now, je suis guéri, car aujourd'hui j'ai peur de mort. The fits of exhaustion which followed his excesses are very remarkable, as they precisely resemble those 
which followed the berserker rages of the Northmen, and the expeditions of the lycanthropists. The case of Monsieur Bertrand is indubitably most singular and anomalous. It scarcely bears the character of insanity, but seems to point rather to a species of diabolical possession. At first, the excesses chiefly followed upon his drinking wine, but after a while they came upon him without exciting cause. The manner in which he mutilated the dead was different. Some he chopped with the spades, others he tore and ripped with his teeth and nails. Sometimes he tore the mouth open and ran the face back to the ears. He opened the stomachs and pulled off the limbs. Although he dug up the bodies of several men, he felt no inclination to mutilate them, whereas he was delighted in rending female corpses. He was sentenced to a year's imprisonment. End of chapter 15 Recording by Martina van Haperen, Amsterdam